Time to get started. Time to get started? Cool. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, <clears throat> I'm Dave Hefner, and uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand and heckle me if I'm talking too fast or if something I say completely disagrees with your constitution. So um, this is how to use Selenium successfully. Um, and just to uh, level set things, I'm going to cover a few introductory topics just to make sure everybody's on the same page before diving into some of the other topics that are actually listed in the abstract. But to start, um, I wanted to at least briefly cover my perspective when I got into testing to help give you kind of my mindset and what's kind of led me to where I am now. So when I first started doing testing with Selenium, I envisioned this chasm, this uh, cliff, where I had to get to the other side, but it wasn't clear how to do it. Where I was, was just getting started with Selenium, and then on the other side were all these people who were like, come on over, it's really cool, it, it works, it's great. Um, and what I realized from struggling with Selenium over the last five years um, is that it's not actually a chasm, it's actually a puzzle. Selenium is a lot like a Rubik's Cube. Uh, given any orientation, there are a set of patterns or heuristics that you can apply that make it so you can solve it, regardless of how it's configured. So everyone here, all of you, have your own Rubik's Cube when it comes to Selenium. And what I'm going to step through are patterns that I apply at company after company that help them solve their version of a Rubik's Cube. So when, you're all, when it's all said and done, what you end up with is how to write business valuable tests that are reusable, maintainable, and resilient across the browsers that you care about. And then you can package those up and scale them for not just you, but for your team. So just briefly stepping through kind of Selenium, what it is. I'm assuming you all know this, but um, the Reader's Digest version, uh, it's a robot sent from the future to help us test web and mobile applications. Uh, it is good at mimicking human action. It is not good at testing lower level functionality, like getting status codes and doing other kinds of things. You can make it do that, but it requires a lot of additional setup, other libraries and that sort of thing. It's not the right tool for the job. Um, there is record and playback, uh, and then there's the object-oriented way to write the tests uh, using uh, local uh, browser drivers and doing things remotely into a grid and you know some sort of cloud provider. Um, and uh, it has a bad rap of being slow, brittle, and hard to maintain, but I'm here to tell you that that's not the case. Um, you, can, you can make it so it's not that. Um, and so step one out of my 10-step process, uh, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, I usually go into a client and ask four questions. Um, and the first question is, how does your business make money? And then what features are being used in your application? And then what browsers are people using to use these features that make you money? And then what things have broken before? And uh, you can get this, like the what has broken before, look in your defect tracker, ask people who have been with the company for a while, you know, whenever you release software, what makes people nervous, that sort of thing. But the outcome you get is what to test and which browsers to care about. And when you get into automation, this is crucial to help really give you clear-cut focus about what to do. And then once you do that, you pick a programming language. We'll just say for argument's sake, Java. I'm assuming you guys like Java, you know Java. If not, feel free to raise your hand and heckle me like I said at the beginning. Um, but it's worth saying that it does not have to be the same language as the application that's being built. You may think it's a possible option because you have developers around you who could help you, but they're often focused on the features they're building, not necessarily free to, to help you with test automation. So um, ask yourself instead, who's going to own it? And if it's you and some less technical people, then you know have a conversation about what language excites you, what language is approachable. And you can also build a framework uh, for testing or use an existing one. And there are a lot of them. I have a list that I keep track of about uh, which open source frameworks exist for which programming languages. And there's a lot of them. But the fun fact is that everybody wants to build their own. Because um, every, everyone's problem, they think, is a unique thing. But it's, it's not. They actually kind of build the same thing over and over again. But it's totally cool because it's actually not that hard to do. So I'll step through just briefly kind of a soup to nuts using Java and JUnit uh, with some uh, little syntactic stuff. Um, and then, of course, obviously, choose an editor 
Um, given that we're talking Java, you want an IDE or else it's just extremely painful, um, which avoids us talking about having an editor war over uh, who, who likes Vim or who likes Emacs, because I'm more of a Vim person myself, but if you're Emacs, then we would have had a fight outside. Um, moving on. Thank goodness we sidestepped that. Um, so Selenium, uh, as I said, mimics human action. Uh, hopefully this is all refresher for you guys, but um, you know, uses locators. Locators are pretty important, and it's worth stressing this because you may have some tests already, but you may also have really brittle locators. Um, and these are the things that will make you very sad. Uh, so locators tell Selenium which HTML element on a page to interact with. And the most common actions uh, that I tend to use are getting a page, finding an element, and once you find that element, clicking, sending text, seeing if something's displayed. Um, and then all the different locator strategies, of course, but um, good locators are unique, descriptive, and unlikely to change. And I'm hoping you're all nodding inside internally. Um, but because of that, you can rule out most of these and really focus on classes and IDs. And then if you need to traverse the page a little more tricky, uh, you can do uh, CSS or XPath, but be careful because you can write, as I said, really brittle locators. Um, there's uh, this perception in Selenium, even still, that the difference between CSS and XPath is there's a huge performance gap. Um, but I, I ran benchmarks a year ago, uh, and when I did that, the difference between the two is very negligible now. Um, the data people were using when they first started talking about this was from like four years ago. And so since uh, newer versions of Selenium, that's all been rectified. And then if you're ever curious about different examples, uh, this is a link to uh, Sauce Labs has a little tutorial breakdown of XPath versus CSS. So whichever one works best for you. Um, and so hopefully if you already have some tests, you know how to find some locators on your own, but uh, there's some cool resources if you're not too well versed in locators. Um, of course, uh, major browsers let you inspect the page. Um, and then something like Firepath or FireFinder lets you visually verify the locator, which is super useful. I used to do things very, very horridly, um, you know, test out locators and see if the see if Selenium would do what I thought. But instead, you can do it right in the browser. Um, there's also this cool game called um, I can't remember the name of it, uh, but it's like a dancing plates game where you can uh, learn how to test out CSS selectors. And then, of course, having a conversation with your developer, um, if uh, or if you are a developer, then have a conversation with yourself. Um, and so uh, this is a simple example login page, but if you inspect it, um, just to quickly show you what Firefinder gets you, um, but if you inspect a button, you say, hey, there's this ID we can use, let's hop over here, let's throw in the CSS selector, and then it highlights it. So you can actually determine if you have the correct uh, locator before moving forward. Um, saves a bunch of time. So writing your first test, um, you, I'm sure you guys all know this, but um, when you write a test, you want to write it using a, uh, some kind of a test framework, ideally a BDD, behavior-driven development, or an X unit, like a test unit uh, style framework. Um, and then within each test, you really want to be concise. You want to test one thing per test. And each test should be able to be run independently and it should be done in a way that's descriptive so that anyone can understand it. Uh, and also, you would want to group like tests together so that you have basically test cases that test similar pieces of functionality. And then if you wanted to test disparate functionality in one test run, you could maybe slice it up in using categories for test grouping. So that's it's like a separate issue we'll cover later. So this login example, where you'd visit this login form, this is like the most common example I can think of Visit a login form, you find the login username field, and you send the password text. Uh, sorry, the username text. Repeat for password, find the submit button and click it, or find the uh, login form and submit it. And so the example I showed you is on this open source application of mine called the internet. So I wrote the internet. It's uh, open source. And uh, so we, the markup for it is, you know, they're just IDs, uh, username, you know, pound username, pound password, and then uh, pound login for the login form. 
and what that looks like for just really simple Selenium commands in Java. You know, you just find, uh, you visit the page, you find an element by its ID, and then you send the username and you send the password, and then you submit it. So if we take this and write a JUnit test, uh, it looks like this. So using uh, a before uh, annotation for setup and instantiating a Firefox driver, because that's the easiest one to do out of the box for local use, and then a teardown to quit the driver and then run the test. And if we add a second test, this would enable us to have a clean browser state for each test run. So, and then of course we need to find an assertion. So we log in and then we verify the page and I'll just jump to the punchline. We find a locator, ta-da, and, and it's just a semantic locator that's a flash notification that denotes semantically that it's successful. So we wanna make sure that that is displayed. And if it is, then we assume, hey, we logged in. Um, now, the part that's commented out is if we actually assert the negative condition, if we assert that, uh, oh, actually, this is, this is the test to make sure that we have a locator that we think is doing what it's supposed to. Um, that's actually a good, a good tip. If you ever write a locator, you've visually verified it, put it in your test. If you actually fat finger the locator, make, make sure the test fails so that you, the test is doing what you think, then change it back. But if we were to actually take this and flip it and assert uh, faults uh, that something wasn't displayed, it could potentially throw an exception. Um, so a common exception would look like this, no such element. And when that happens, you also could potentially run into a stale element reference error. There's a full list of web driver exceptions uh, in the uh, language documentation at this link. And I'm gonna post these slides after, so all the links, they're all bit.ly links, so hopefully they're easier for you to catch as I'm going through them, but I'll post the slides after the talk and uh, put it, I guess, wherever the conference information is so you can get all these links. But if you were to um, add, take an abstract your display check, you can wrap it in a try catch, so that if you were to try to find something and it wasn't actually on the page, Selenium would throw this exception and instead you could return false. So you can actually see, is this displayed on the page? And Slim could tell you, no, it would just give a Boolean response. And uh, I have a more thorough write up at that link as well. So briefly, uh, how many people here know what page objects are and use them? Fantastic. So. So, so hopefully this all makes sense. Uh, normally you would just write a test, it's brittle, everyone has the sad face, and then you implement a page object, and everyone's happy. You guys seem very happy. It's because you use page objects, that's fantastic. Um, so of course our login example, uh, this is a very crude page object, I'm sure most of you use something like the HTML elements from Yandex or the, like a page factory. Um, I, this is just a really simple class that just abstracts all the locators. Uh, has a constructor that checks to make sure things are in the right place, has the behavior, has some sort of display helper, because then it makes the test look super clean uh, and there's no locators in the test. Um, as I mentioned, uh, HTML elements from Yandex, page factory, awesome. Um, but how many of you use a base page object of a solid layer? Fewer of you. So maybe that's more sad faces, sorry guys. Okay, you would use it. Okay, let me talk about it. Okay, um, so much like how you write a page object to model a page, you can actually create something that instead of having Selenium commands directly in your page object, you create an abstraction object that has a simple domain specific language of your Selenium commands. Yes, is there a question? Hand. Yeah, you use it. Everyone uses this. It's just not called a base page. What do you guys call it? <laughs> okay, abstract page. Okay, Every, so many names for the same idea. This is great. Then everyone is happy. This is great. Okay, cool. And so you all know that it's global reuse, more readable, insulates you from Selenium API changes. Cool, nodding heads, great. Because um, this, this was something that Jason Labia from Google talked about, how they, it helped them do a massive transition from Selenium 1 to Selenium 2. Um, I, I think the whole insulating from API change is less of a concern with Selenium 3, but it's still cool, still helpful. Uh, so 
I'm assuming you have something similar. You have just really simple user deployment commands, and then, yeah, see, smiling faces, great, cool. And then implemented, it cleans up your page object, so you all know that it all fits together magically as like that. Tests, page objects, page uh, abstract, base page, et cetera. So explicit weights, do you guys use those? And I think some people are hesitant to raise their hand. Um, so for those of you that don't know, you specify an amount of time and an action. You'll wait, uh, Selenium will repeatedly try until either the action completes or times out, throws a timeout exception. Um, so like a really simple example is this page that clicks a button, there's a loading bar. The internet has it all, folks. Uh, and then it displays hello world. And if you inspect it, there is an ID of finish. So in my abstract base page, something like this, um, having some sort of simple wait for uh, that, cut, you know, you could pass null for a timeout, or uh, if you do, it'll set a default timeout of five, or you can specify a timeout. And then having a method for waiting for is displayed. Um, it's just one way to do it. That way you can to choose, to dis, uh, choose to specify a timeout or not. Uh, and then a simple page object for that example would be this. And so I can, in the finish chest, finish text, present lookup, you could wait for is displayed, wait for 10 seconds if I wanted to. Um, but by, by doing that, you can apply explicit weights all over your tests as opposed to one blanket implicit weight or hard-coded sleeps. Hopefully you all know that. And um, I'm still surprised a lot of people, a lot of companies still maybe do hard-coded sleeps because it's easier, but um, I think with with explicit weights, it's easier to tune for each different browser, uh, whereas a lot of times it may be easier to write your tests in Firefox because that's what's available to you, or potentially Chrome, but maybe not Internet Explorer. So in my experience, uh, a lot of times you'll get your tests working in Firefox and then run them in Internet Explorer and then find a whole bunch of tests break. And then you have to go in, but you can tune your explicit weights so they're a little bit more resilient to that. And then if you run them in Chrome, maybe they execute a lot faster and test break a different way, and then you tune for that. And then ultimately, you kind of have this sweet spot <laughs> where your application works across multiple browsers. And if you're in that state, then you're usually pretty good. OK, on to the main event, prepping for use. Um, so building your own test harness. Um, I found, uh, stepping through this in Java and JUnit, that it, a lot of it's already kind of done for you, um, given the tooling that, that exists, so pretty awesome. Um, a simple organizational structure, uh, a central setup and teardown, uh, making it so you can re, you know, specify uh, runtime properties um, to reconfigure how your test harness runs, uh, some, some simple, potentially robust reporting and logging, uh, parallelization, uh, and then finding a way to group your tests into different flexible, dynamic test packs. So uh, I, when I did step through this, it was Java, JUnit, Maven. And with Maven, you get kind of a default folder structure already. Um, and then you can just use packages to organize things cleanly. Pretty simple. Uh, central setup and teardown in JUnit. Um, originally, I, was, I showed using before and after annotations. And you could do that here. but uh, by abstracting into a base test like this. If I use before and after, I wouldn't be able to use it in my test. So if I'm instantiating page objects, I wouldn't be able to do it that way. So instead, I can use a rule, an external resource rule, and, uh, and use that, and use a before and after, which these will fire before the before annotation and before the after annotation. And so for more info, if you're not familiar with JUnit rules, uh, is this link. And then uh, a simple config with defaults. Um, I found uh, using an interface to be pretty helpful. Um, that way I can um, implement it into a base test or my, my abstracted uh, page object class and then have sensible defaults and pull in properties or environment variables using a dash D flag or storing it in like my bash RC file. And um, reporting and logging. Um, so there's two, uh, I separate and talk about it uh, as two, but ultimately it probably comes together as one. 
Um, but machine readable things, like things that were, are going to be consumed by your continuous integration server, uh, would be JNA XML. Uh, and then things that are human readable would be like screenshots, failure messages, stack trace, stuff that's helpful for you to debug. Um, within Maven, you get a, pr uh, a good amount of debug output. Uh, you don't get screenshots, but you get a failure message, stack trace, and JNA XML. So a lot of it's already done for you. Um, I'm assuming, since I'm pretty sure the Allure framework came out of Selenium Camp a year or two ago, you guys all know what it is. Um, but as far as I know, one of the big problems that wasn't, hasn't been solved well until recently was getting a good um, language agnostic HTML test report generator. Uh, and the guys at Yandex did a great job. They, they wrote it. It's called Allure Framework. If you're not using it, you should definitely check it out. Um, you can grab screenshots and then generate it regardless of which language you're on uh, and which tooling you're using. Um, parallelization, as I mentioned, things just seem a lot easier in, in Java and JUnit. Um, but the three different ways I've found you can do parallelization to speed up your tests so they don't run in series uh, is you can do things in code. You could do it through your test runner. Uh, or you can do it on a continuous integration server that just consumes your tests and spreads them out. Um, what I found is using the Maven Surefire plugin makes this super easy. Um, you specify the number of concurrent threads and then the method that you want to execute with. And it's right in the documentation. It's very clear. Um, it's kind of refreshing to see such clear documentation, actually. Um, but you just specify executing by classes and methods and then however many tests you have and however many threads you specify, it just figures it out and then just runs them in parallel and it just handles it for you and then gives you the output that you want. Um, my pro tip, uh, and I don't know if everyone shares this opinion, but um, it's often really a really good idea to run your tips, or sorry, run your uh, tests in random order. Uh, this will help identify if there are any cross-test dependencies, uh, and uh, which typically present themselves as very odd, transient behavior. And when, when that happens, you can start to dive into the test failures and find the issues and decouple your tests. Because when you run things in parallel, you want to try to limit the number of test dependencies that you have. Like you don't want to set up a, a state with one test and then have another test run unless you really explicitly intend that to happen and potentially remove that from like a parallel test run. Um, but there's a library in JUnit that makes it super easy to do. Um, so it's at this link, the JUnit random order. Everyone still with me? Okay, great. So um, test grouping. How many people do category? How many people do test grouping or know what that means? In JUnit, it's categories, kind of. Um, cool. So um, basically, you apply metadata to your tests, and it enables you to um, specify which uh, which metadata you want to run. Uh, and so uh, Goiko Atzig calls these test packs, the idea that you can segment your huge swath of tests into small chunks that are coherent, concise, descriptive, fast, et cetera. Um, and then the slower running tests could potentially be separated. So some some category ideas. You can you can annotate which things are still a work in progress and exclude those um, from being run during your production test cycles. You can do, um, uh, Adam Goucher refers to these as uh, shallow and deep test categories, where shallow can be like your smoke tests, your, your critical, super fast tests. And then your deep tests could be your longer running, uh, more robust regression. And then you could also use like story numbers for the work that's being completed, which could be a fun way to dynamically group tests for a specific sprint or a release. So different ideas. Um, JUnit categories, also another excellently documented uh, feature. It's worth it checking out. Um, now, cross-browser execution. How many people run their tests locally um, using one or two browsers? Does anyone do multiple browsers running locally? How many people have a grid or you know, how many use Selenium grid? Anyone using Sauce Labs or Browser Stack or any? Cool. So it's a good mix. OK. Um, so it's worth talking just really briefly about um, browser drivers. Um, so with Selenium 2, the idea that um, these 
uh, binaries that are little shims that sit between your tests and uh, Selenium is how Selenium can actually talk to the browser. And so um, ideally each browser manufacturer maintains these browser drivers and some don't. Uh, but you know, there's one for Chrome, there's Firefox, IE, Opera, Safari. Um, Opera, uh, you don't need to use the separate driver if it's after version 12.16 because Opera switched to the back end that Chrome uses. So you just test using Chrome and you also get Opera. Ta-da, magic. <laughs> It'll just work. Um, so typically, um, each documentation is a little bit different, um, but for the most part, you have to download a binary and add it to your path, your system path. If you do that, you're usually pretty good. Um, you can also, for some of them, specify the, pa the path to the binary before instantiating the driver object. So for Chrome, for example, you can say, here is where the Chrome driver lives, um, and then if it's in your uh, actual project directory, you can specify it as a relative path to it, um, and then instantiate it. And if you don't, then it'll j if you have downloaded the binary and haven't done this, it'll, of course, tell you that it's broken. You need to do it and give you a link to the documentation. But each, uh, each browser driver is different. It has slightly different constraints. Um, so do read the documentation. As for um, Selenium Grid, for those of you that don't know, um, you basically start with your tests, and you point your tests at a grid hub. And then the grid hub maintains a series of nodes, and those nodes have browsers. So you basically say, uh, tell your, te your tests tell the grid what browser and platform that you want, and then it will return to you a driver object that has that, that's connect connected to a node that has a browser. Um, so this is all done using the Selenium standalone server, uh, and you just launch, if you were to set up a grid, you would just do it by specifying different runtime flags. Um, it's worth noting that just because you have access to all these browsers, it does not handle parallel execution for you. That's something you need to handle. Um, but it can support it. If you send a bunch of requests to it, it can handle those concurrently. So set, standing up a hub is you know, just the uh, dash roll hub uh, flag. And then for the node or nodes, um, it's just uh, dash roll node, and then the URL to the hub, and then slash grid slash register, and then it says, hey, I'm, I'm here, I'm connected. Um, and then once you have that, assuming you, say, have spun up a bunch of machines on AWS or have a bunch of VMs, and you have all these kind of parsed out, you now can point your tests at your hub and have access to all these different browsers that you didn't before. Um, and then it's a simple change in terms of how you execute. You have to specify capabilities uh, and then specify uh, the browser. You can either specify uh, the browser when, inst when calling and instantiating capabilities, or you can actually specify it as a capability flag. Um, and then you specify the platform, uh, the actual grid URL, and then pass in the URL in, as a remote web driver with the capabilities, and then you get back the desired browser. Um, it's worth mentioning the docs, of course. Um, I have a write-up that's more thorough on grid, um, and but those examples are in Ruby. Uh, but uh, it's worth talking briefly about Selenium Grid Extras and Selenium Grid Scaler. These are two open source libraries. Um, and I, I'm not sure if you guys got to see the panel that happened just before this, but uh, Dima Kovalenko and uh, Marcus Morel, um, they each have these libraries. Um, Dima wrote and maintains Selenium Grid Extras, which is a fantastic library for managing your own grid infrastructure in a reliable way, where it handles like the, the pre-configuration that needs to happen for Internet Explorer, like the protected mode, all that kind of stuff. It uh, cycles browsers, reboots machines for you, uh, and it does video capture of your test runs. Uh, and then Selenium Grid Scaler is this auto-scaler for AWS that will, uh, if, if, you're, if you've ran out of nodes, if your hub is saturated, it can go ahead, it will detect that and spin up more nodes for you. 
So if you combine the two together, it's kind of a uh, browser stack sauce labs killer because it it's auto scaling grid and it's video recording of your tests. It's pretty awesome. They're both open source. Uh, they're worth checking out. So it's worth mentioning also um, a commercial grid implementation. So under the hood, Sauce Labs and Browser Stack, they use Selenium Grid, and they work the same, very similarly. You just point your tests at Sauce Labs at their grid, and then they give you a browser. And the setup is very similar. You specify the browser name, the capability platform, uh, and then you can also pass in the name of the test, uh, and then you have to, of course, pass in your credentials. Um, it's it's a, a basic auth URL endpoint. And what you get back is just like before with a grid, it's just a browser, except it's running on their stack. Um, some additional considerations that you might not have with grid, um, you need to make it so you can dynamically pass the test name, which in JUnit would be, you'd use like a test watcher to you know, dynamically grab the test name and, and pass it in. Uh, and there's also grabbing and setting the, the status of the test so that in the dashboard in Sauce Labs, it'll say pass or fail. Uh, and then also whether or not you want to run your tests against um, something behind your firewall, uh, which Sauce Labs has a secure tunnel. Um, those are all good things. Um, so if you want more information on the platforms that are available for Sauce Labs, uh, or um, I did a walkthrough of it in a post, and then there's also the Java tutorial where they cover TestNG and uh, JUnit. And then if you haven't ever seen a dashboard view of their site, um, it looks like this when, a, when your test is finished. You get screenshots of everything, all the different Selenium commands. There's a video recording uh, of the test. And then there's also um, Selenium log, and there's metadata. So super useful because it just comes out of the box is what you get, as opposed to having to implement your own framework uh, that has all this HTML reporting, unless you use something like the open source libraries for Selenium Grid that I mentioned. Um, so kind of tying it all together, um, putting a bow on it. The reason that you do all this is not for you to ideally run these and run and tell someone when something breaks. It's you want to have a machine do it all the time uh, when there's a change. And so I call these you know, feedback loops. You're trying to build very short, fast feedback for your team uh, to let them know when there's an issue as early as possible. And so uh, you can do this with continuous integration and potentially some notifications. Um, so uh, when there's some kind of a job failure, you want to notify the right people. So you can do, uh, for people that are you know, remote or even in the same Space, you know, email, chat, uh, text message. Uh, there's also like um, ambient orbs. Like people have like glowing orbs that change color when the build fails. Or uh, I've seen really uh, interest like this uh, automated rabbit that speaks. Uh, that you can you can make it like call out people's names by by scraping the commit history and then publicly shaming them by saying you broke the build. Um, I may have built that script once. It's pretty fun. Um, so those are, all, those are all great things, just letting people know when something broke um, so that they can take a look and actually care about it. And so what this ideally looks like, in my mind, is a really simple workflow. Um, code gets committed. Uh, unit and integration tests, you know, do they pass? Yes or no? Uh, if yes, deploy to an environment where automated tests can run. And, and once they run, all right, well, did the deployment succeed at least? Like, is the web server up? And if yes, then run the automated tests, like these critical tests, like can you, know, can you log in, can you, you know, do your purchase function, et cetera. Um, and if yes, then you can deploy to the next environment, which could be you know, whatever you want it to be. It could be staging, it could be for manual testing, for user acceptance testing. Uh, and if no, notify the team. And bonus points if you make it stop the line. You make it so things are broken. Make sure somebody looks. Work cannot proceed until, until it's fixed. And if that happens, then I think people will really care about quality and really fix problems when they arise. Um, and what this looks like with a really simple CI configuration in something like Jenkins. Is everyone familiar with Jenkins? Open source, awesome, cool looking dude. Um, but you create a simple job, 
uh, and you, you configure it to pull in your test code. It can be in a version control system, uh, ideally, uh, and it would pull, pull that in, and then you'd set up build triggers. It could be, uh, if it's the same CI server as the development workflow, you can trigger it off of uh, another test job that runs, uh, or you can trigger it based on uh, a code commit to the version control system, or you can schedule it. Um, and then you would configure your build steps, which would just be the goals, the runtime flags that you want to run. Uh, and then you could configure it to consume whatever test reports that you use. Uh, set up your notifications, which can be anything really. There's plugins, there's hundreds of plugins, and they have one for like every chat program out there for like Slack, for HipChat, et cetera, um, for email. You configure that, and then run it and view the results, and then high five your neighbor. It's an important step. Make sure you high five firmly both hands. I don't know if that's something you guys do in the Ukraine, but I'm open to giving high fives if, if anyone wants one later. Um, so, um, so that's it for kind of like the my really overarching, here's how I do it. Um, the nine steps are important. The tenth step is really, here's how you can find more information if you're so keen to keep looking. Um, the, this was actually a separate talk I gave at Selenium Conf in India last year, but um, so there's slides in the video um, from that talk. Um, but this is, uh, I'll just step through each of the bits, but in terms of documentation and tips, um, a lot of this you may all know, some of it hopefully is new, but um, Selenium HQ, the main website for the Selenium project, some information there is useful, some of it's probably not. Um, so. <laughs> So, so uh, some you know take it with a grain of salt, um, but it's still good to know it exists. Hopefully, someday it will get updated. Um, there's also the wiki, um, the Google Code wiki, uh, which actually has a ton of uh, useful info there. It's probably where if you've read about page objects and page factory and so on, that's where that stuff lives, and that's kind of where the developers tend to post things that are relevant. Um, there's my tip newsletter, um, which. Up until recently, was only in Ruby, but I'm converting them to ideally most every language that's supported by Selenium, starting with Java, maybe working in some Python, um, possibly some C sharp. Um, but I have um, there's like 70 or so long form write ups with code examples, uh, stepping through all these different concepts, um, anywhere from uploading file to standing up grid to you know, et cetera, et cetera. I try to cover everything, and if I'm missing something. Um, I'm always open to someone asking me a question, and then I usually do a write-up and then email them back the link. <laughs> Here's the answer to your question. Um, and then in terms of blogs, um, there's the official Selenium blog, um, which is hit or miss in terms of how active it is, um, but um, there's occasionally uh, a post. It's usually where news gets announced, like where is the next Selenium conf, or uh, when is the new version of Selenium released? Like that's kind of where that stuff goes. Um, there's actually a someone wrote a blog post uh, uh, containing all Selenium blogs. Like so, if someone has their own personal blog talking about Selenium, their experience with it, this is a good resource to kind of show. It's like a map to show you where they all live. And then there's the obvious forums. Um, there's a Selenium LinkedIn users group. There's a lot of a noisy user group, but there are, there are sometimes some nuggets of wisdom in there. Um, of course, Stack Overflow, which I'm sure nobody here uses Stack Overflow. Okay. Um, Quora, sometimes it exists. Um, some people ask questions, sometimes people answer. Um, but really, the meat of it ends up on the Selenium Users Google group. Um, and then if you're interested in kind of the what's happening, what are the next features, what's the status of things, the developer Google group is a good place to go. And then um, there's a Yahoo group um, called the Agile Testing Yahoo group. And this is actually an interesting one. It's not specifically tied to Selenium or necessarily test automation, but like every, every industry thought leader that I've ever met at a conference or have read about or have read books from, hang out on this mailing list and are very gracious with answering questions in a thorough way. So it's I, I list it because it's like a resource not a lot of people know about. Um, so if you have some really challenging strategy question or like kind of big decision 
like putting it to these people is a fantastic use of like writing the email, hitting send, and then seeing if they respond. And usually they do in a very like long form way. So very thoughtful, good resource. Um, I think meetups, because um, clearly we're all meeting here together. Um, there's some there's some really good ones. Uh, I don't know what the meetup scene is like here uh, in Ukraine or, or wherever uh, home is for you, but it's worth looking on like meetup.com or whatever your local uh, meetup site is. Um, but for those of you that don't have a local one, uh, David Burns and, and myself, uh, David Burns is the maintainer of the Python bindings um, and one of the authors of the WebDriver W3C standard. Uh, him and I do a uh, Google Hangout uh, every couple months probably and talk about whatever the latest testing news is for Selenium and we try to have a panel of people come on and, and have a conversation about what's going on. And then we uh, record the video and post it to the official Selenium blog um, so that we, we can get information out to people. Um, and so I think we're about due for another one, but that's uh, that's a good one. We try it, we, we've, we've toyed with doing live question Q&A kind of stuff, and we're still trying to find the right format, but it's probably one of the, uh, the closest things short of hanging out on the IRC chat channel for Selenium that you'll get to getting relevant Selenium news. Um, and then meetup.com has all the in-person Selenium meetups. And then Sauce Labs um, is big on sponsoring uh, meetups, like food and drink, and helping people like figure out how to how to actually roll out your own, like figure out messaging and organizing. So they have this blog post on how to start your own Selenium meetup. So if you, if you thought, huh, I really want one of those, I'm willing to organize it, uh, Sauce Labs could be your first sponsor. So you can have like, pizza and beer or whatever at your at your first meetup. And then um, conference talks, like the ones here, uh, or uh, Selenium Conf. Um, this is a link to the one for um, previous year's Selenium Conf talks. Uh, those are always a good resource for finding more information. Um, a lot of times, meetups will post similar stuff, slides and talks and so on. And then there's a bunch of books. Um, there's more books that are available than what I have listed here, but um, like if you're just getting started, like Selenium 2 Testing Tools is is a good book. It's a David Burns uh, introductory book on Selenium. Uh, Dima Kovalenko recently released uh, Selenium Testing Tools Cookbook. Uh, I think that's right. No, he wrote Selenium Design Patterns. I apologize. Selenium Testing Tools Cookbook is another good book. That one's a little more advanced. Um, has some recipes for uh, doing test automation. Uh, I wrote the Selenium Guidebook. Um, which covers everything I talked about, but more in depth with more robust examples, because uh, it's really hard to fit everything into a 50 minute talk. Um, Selenium Simplified, um, Alan Richardson in the UK, uh, he wrote a book on how to do Java and Selenium. And then Dima wrote Design Patterns, which um, while the book is written in Ruby, he actually has Java examples. So hopefully Ruby doesn't turn you guys away too easily. But the material is fantastic. Um, I was a, a fact checker for, uh, a reviewer for his book, and I, I think it's tremendous. Um, so I definitely think it's worth checking out. And the good stuff. Um, the issue tracker for Selenium, um, often a misunderstood tool, uh, often a lesser known uh, tool, it has all of the open issues for Selenium. And there's like eight, 800 open issues for Selenium right now. Um, but if you have a problem and you're sure it's probably a Selenium bug, uh, it's worth seeing if there's an open issue. Because if there is, somebody has probably posted that they've found that issue as well, and they've found a workaround for it. Uh, the most recent example I can think of is if, if you're using something like Browser Stack or uh, Sauce Labs, and you want to specify your platform using a string as opposed to just the platform constructor, uh, the late, like as a version 2.4.4, that would not work. It will throw an exception. Uh, and, but there's an open issue for it. And it says, oh, you need to use the previous version, because this is broken in 2.4.4. So 2.4.3.1. And it was like, ta-da, work around. Um, but, fun fact, as of this morning, 2.4.5 was released, so hopefully everyone's problems go away. Um, but the issue tracker, if, if there's not an issue for what, you, what you're experiencing, then you can open an issue. Um, 
and know that it's not potentially a duplicate. And um, there's a blog post uh, that Jim Evans wrote on recommendations to writing a good issue. Um, and it typically has to do with providing an HTML sample and a test that makes it so that the developers can easily replicate what you're seeing. And if you can't do that, they're probably going to troll you and make you feel bad. So, <laughs> um, but the best place you can go, uh, of course, is look at the source code. Um, or I, the next best thing is uh, the Selenium IRC chat channel is probably your best bet. That's where the core committers hang out. It's open for anybody. You just log on, ask your question, and odds are you'll get a response. Um, and I can jump quickly ahead to the video using just the web chat. Um, this was prepared for Selenium Conf, but it'll still work. So the channel is pound Selenium. It's on Freenode. And then once you log in and connect to the chat, uh, everybody will be in there. As you can see, it's very popular. Um, and so there's a bot, and if you ask it, it will always tell you Simon Stewart, uh, who is the, uh, he's the guy in charge of the Selenium project. He, he wrote WebDriver. Um, so we have a sense of humor, I guess. because Simon always breaks the build. Um, so just, just to close out um, my 10 steps to solving the puzzle, uh, you know, define a test strategy to figure out what to test and on what browsers. Pick a programming language. Use uh, Selenium for what it's good for, its fundamentals. Uh, write, you know, your introductory tests and then refactor them so that you have reusable, maintainable code. Make your tests resilient using explicit weights. Package things into a simple framework. Uh, add in the cross-browser execution that you need. Build an automated feedback loop and then continue to find information on your own. And if you do that, then you end up with reusable, maintainable, resilient tests that you can package and scale for your, you and your team. And uh, I'll close with this quote. Um, uh, you may think that your puzzle is unique, but really, everyone's trying to solve the same puzzle. Yours is just configured differently, and it's solvable. Uh, and you can quote me on it. So, thanks. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Um, I think we got a little bit of time for questions, maybe. And if not, feel free to, I'll be here for the whole conference. Um, question in the back. I don't have a microphone. <laughs> uh, Can you repeat the question? For, I heard framework. Do I use a framework, and have I heard about a specific one? So see that this. Oh, here we go. Microphone. Um, yes, I'm using Fukudit framework, or did you hear about that? Because uh, uh, it has uh, most of wrappers and uh, would help you organize your tests. Mm, uh, I, I use my own framework called Chemistry Kit, which is written in Ruby. Uh, there is Selenium Framework. I keep a list of Selenium Frameworks, which... Uh, hey, did you hear about Pocketit? I haven't... Right? Uh, no, I'm not sure I've heard about that one. But I, I would love to hear more about it. I try to keep an updated list of uh, available Selenium Frameworks. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>